The countdown begins to India's new president polling for the presidential election. Draupadi Murmu, NDA de Rashtrapati Sthana Arthi Agum. Yashwansana. Rashtrapati Umidwar ke tawar kuru tara. Kale kon bane ka Rashtrapati Jiya? India is electing its 16th president on July 18th. The whole country is waiting to know who is going to be next. But who elects the president? Surely it's not us, the common people involved in the process. At least not directly. The process of electing the president is a little complicated and unsurprisingly, there's math involved in the process. Hi, I am Nilakanta Bhanu Prakash, the world's fastest human calculator and I am going to shed some light on the math behind electing the president of India. The presidential election is different from the state and union elections where we the people vote directly and elect our representatives. The president gets elected through an electoral college consisting of elected members of Rajya Sabha, Lok Sabha, legislative assembly members of each state and elected members of each union territory possessing a legislative assembly. However, each state has a different population. Hence, assigning all the MLAs the same vote weightage will result in an improper representation of the people. To solve this problem of disproportionate representation, the Constitution of India has laid out a method to decide the weightage of votes for MLAs from every state. The voting weightage of an MLA is decided according to the population of their respective state using the formula total population of the state divided by total number of MLAs multiplied by 1000. Let's consider the state of Karnataka. The total population of the state according to the 1971 census is 2 crore 92,99,014. The total MLAs currently is 224. Wondering why the census data of 1971 is used? You'll find that at the end of the video. Now, using the formula, the vote weightage of an MLA from Karnataka will turn out to be 131. Similarly, for a populous state like UP, it will be 208 votes per MLA which is the highest voting value. Whereas with seven votes per MLA, Sikkim has the lowest voting value. And the total vote value of MLAs from all the states combined comes up to be 5.5 lakh. The case with the members of parliament, however, is different. The Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha constituencies have been drawn out in such a way that the number of people in each constituency is roughly the same across the country. So unlike MLAs, MPs already represent the same number of people in the state. Thus, voting value of MPs remains the same across the board. An MP's vote value is calculated by using the formula total vote value of MLAs divided by total number of MPs, which is 708 votes per MP. Hence, the total votes of MPs and MLAs are almost equal. In this year's election, the vote value for MPs will decrease to 700 votes per MP. Let me know in the comments below if you know why. So that's how vote weightages for MPs and MLAs are calculated. But the math just doesn't end here. It extends to voting procedure too. The vote of each member is a single transferable vote and each elector can give their preferences among the total pool of candidates for the president. After the day of the elections, the returning officer, who is the Secretary General of Rajya Sabha, calculates the total value of votes polled by each candidate. The total number of valid votes is counted according to which the winner is decided. For example, if the total valid votes is 10,000, the winner should have at least 5,001 votes. Wait, what if no candidate meets the quota? A recounting is done and in the process, the candidate who receives the lowest vote is eliminated. Say that there are four candidates in total and the total valid votes are 10,000. The vote distribution is as follows. Now, since candidate A with the highest vote has failed to receive the quota to win the election, candidate C will be eliminated and the 1,000 votes received by C will be distributed among the other candidates according to their second preference. Say out of 1,000 votes, 500 goes to candidate B, which is the second preference, and 400 of the second preferences go to candidate D, and 100 go to candidate A. The updated tally of votes will be as follows. The quota hasn't still been met by any candidates. The same process repeats and recurs until candidate D's votes will be distributed among A and C. The final tally will be 4,900 votes for A and 5,100 votes for B. Finally, we have a clear winner by the last round of counting. This is the algorithm behind electing a president in India. What's interesting about the process is how the transferable vote system works. Like in our example, it initially seemed like candidate A was going to win, but in the end with the process of elimination and redistribution of votes received by other candidates, B surprisingly emerged as the victor. 
Now, for the people who waited till the end, the Election Commission of India will be using the 1971 census date till 2026 to avoid accounting for the population change within these years. Why? Because the vote value of MLAs is dependent on what the state's population is. The most recent data would always change the vote value and states may have no choice but to keep their population high because the more people there are, the more vote value the MLAs will have. Hence, the 1971 census is used to incentivize population control and to encourage family planning programs in the states. Fascinated by how much math is used in the domain of politics and administration, like, share and subscribe for more such application-based math content. Also, let me know in the comments if you have any questions or topics that I should be covering. Want to become 4x quicker and better at math? Check out Bhansu's experiential math learning courses. Book a free demo by clicking the link in the description below.